So, uh, just to give you a, uh, an overview of what I'm going to say, I'm going to begin by talking about uh, AI and machine learning and, and point out to you that although there's a lot of overlap, they are not at all the same thing. Um, then I want to give you a lightning primer on machine learning so that, uh, you know, within five, six slides you will be a world expert in machine learning. And then I want to talk about a cautionary note about the reality of machine learning, and in particular what is known as data bias. And then talk a little bit about AI and machine learning in medical imaging and then in mammography, and then point the way to what is the future, and there's vastly more to it than CAD. So, if you walk around this show now, or if you read any of the AI literature, you will be, proceed you will be presented with a picture that looks something like this. It's overwhelmingly all about machine learning, or there's little bits of stuff to do with robotics and vision and speech and various things like that, but AI is considered to be no more and no less than machine learning. And I think you want to, I want to point out to you that if you look back about 25 years, it wasn't like that at all. In fact, this is, this is, the, series, this is the papers that were taken from the International Joint Conference on AI from 1985, and if you, if you look at it, there was very, very little at all in those days on machine learning. It was nearly all on robotics, and vision was huge, speech understanding was huge. Um, so, um, um, as I say, that's how it's considered now. That's how it was 25 years ago. What is a reasonable point of view? And this point of view I'm going to try and present to you in this talk is this, that we have a very powerful set of tools that you can combine with and extend our existing armories in machine, in, in image analysis and reasoning and so forth. Now, people talk about machine learning and actually they talk about it in, in ways which are really are really quite naive. So let me go right back to the very basics and try and show you how machine learning works, um, what its strengths are and what its weaknesses are. So let's take something really, really, really easy, which is in fact the recognition of hand-printed characters. If I take a letter like this for an F, you may say, well, one of the characteristic features is that it's got a kind of a local junction here, it's got a local junction here, it's got these three endpoints here. But then if I show you the, an un, a glimpse of the reality of the way in which people write hand-printed characters, you see that every single one of those features doesn't occur in many, many cases, and yet we effortlessly view these things as the letter F. So how, what, what might be... Uh, what might we conclude from that? Well, the first thing to say is that real-life variations show that taking local features is just a very bad idea. So what, what else could we do? Well, what you can do is you can take, for example, you can blank out the bottom and you can ask how much stuff there is in the top, uh, or indeed in the bottom, or at the left, or at the right. And these are much more robust to the variations that you see in real life, which I've shown you on the top line here. In fact, this thing down the bottom here mathematically, if I may, amounts to simply computing the transform of each of these characters with a, a thing which is known mathematically as a convolution, and in, a, in this particular case with a Haar wavelet. So convolution turns out to be something that's been around in machine learning since 1962. It's one of the very few advances of being a geriatric. So what we then do is we compute a bunch of features, no matter whether they're, they're Haar features, local features, or whatever you, and we go, for example, to instances of F, which I've shown here in red, which are classified by a perfect infallible human, otherwise known as my wife. And we have instances of E down here, which are green. And then, in essence, what, what the recognition of these characters amounts to is putting down a decision boundary. In this case, I've drawn what is actually the simplest thing you could ever imagine, which is to write down a linear decision boundary. A linear decision boundary, given the value of feature one, which might be the amount of stuff in the bottom, and feature two, which might be the amount of stuff in the left, those things, a linear decision boundary, simply amounts to taking a weighted sum of those two numbers. Right now, in this case, I've only shown two, but of course, if there'd have been three, it would have been a plane. If it'd have been a hundred features, it would have been a hyperplane. Okay? Mathematically, it just amounts to having a linear, a linear uh, relationship like that. And so, right from the start, from about 1962, 1965 onwards, People already knew that you could get a series of images with classes associated by a, an expert, and then you could try to learn these various weights, because if you learn the weights, you learn the decision boundary, 
and that's all there is to it. And all of the effort went into doing the training, and then runtime was trivial. You just give another example, you compute these features, you find out whether it's below or above this particular thing. And when you've taken all the letters, you end up with a fractionated version of this that looks like a kind of frac rather like a, a tectonic map of, uh, of space. And then you think, hmm, suppose we didn't have just 25 examples, suppose we had 25 million examples. Maybe we could learn the features as well. That's a quite interesting thought, and that's at the heart of what's involved in unsupervised machine learning that we're doing now. Well, that was, that was all as it was then, and that's really pretty much how uh, the US Post Service did uh, automatic recognition of characters until 1970-72. And then, bang, out of the blue, there was a book published by Seymour Papert and Marvin Minsky, which is called Perceptrons, and which showed that if you take linear decision boundaries like this, they are intrinsically and very, very substantially limited in what they can do. So that really killed off a lot of work in AI and machine learning in the early 70s. Well, now let's look at a rather more complex decision boundary. Now, this one sure as hell is not linear, right? So how might we deal with this? Well, one idea is quite straightforward. Imagine that these are two opposing armies, right? And then what we do is we've got some of these soldiers which are quite close to the front line. Some of these guys were much further back in reserve. And what they might do is they might kind of push out towards the, uh, what appears to be the current battle line. And then they'd retreat if there were too many of the opposition and so forth. What I just described to you in words is what is known as support vector machines. Support vector machines have more recently had uh, a development in what are known as random forest classifiers. But there's been an alternative, and this has been perhaps the most pervasive idea that's been around in machine learning for quite some time, which is, in fact, to take a network representation. This is no different from the mathematics I wrote down before. You simply write down these features exactly as we had before, and the weight's still going to here and tell you whether it's an E or an F. I just happen to have represented it as a network. The great innovation of the 1990s, of the 1980s, sorry, mostly by Terry Sosinovsky and Jeffrey Hinton, um, was to introduce what was known as a hidden, a hidden layer and to put a nonlinear step between these various layers that went into it. was only one hidden layer originally. And the idea basically was you'd still classify E and F, but to learn the weights, you'd effectively do change of variables very much like you do in first year mathematics. In, in, uh, in college. It's really, really very, very simple. It's just change of variables. So the great idea then was to do back propagation from the actual known answers with this change of variables to come back to find out what these various weights are. That's all that was done in the 90s. And that, it turns out amazingly, by that one little innovation, that completely removes all of those theorems that Minsky and Papert had produced in that book called perceptrons that have killed off this field, which is quite amazing. One change. Now, in practice, however, although this was done in the late 1980s, they were still really quite limited. So what has happened since is that we've had a surge of power, of compute power, and these two things have happened, and they bring together the two ideas that I've just introduced to you. One, you don't just have a single layer, you have multiple layers, that's so-called deep neural networks. And the other thing to do is, you rely upon convolutions. Convolutions are just linear weighted sums of information. You take those two things together, you have convolution based you have deep neural networks, and that is what the vast majority of the hype around this show is all about. Two very, very simple ideas. Okay? Now, in fact, you have to interject, inject non-linearities at each step. We've known that for at least 30 years, and there's a whole way in which you can do it in terms of uh, of, of very spatial pooling or by doing rectification units and what have you. In practice, to make these things work, you need vast data sets, the so-called big data. I'll come back to that in a second. We often don't have that in medical imaging. So, for example, one of our companies over here, Perspective Diagnostics, we simply didn't have that, that number of images available to us. And so it turns out you can go back to yet another idea that we've only known about since 1807, which is, in fact, you do things at multiple scales, exactly like in the Fourier transform or the wave of transform. Namely, you do things over multiple spatial scales, and so you can go from fine to coarse and back again. 
This is the idea underlying what is known as UNET. So if you take those three ideas, the idea of multiple scales, the idea of multiple levels, the idea of convolution, you have got every single thing that you will find on this show right now. That's it. So now let's think a little bit about um, what we see at the moment with uh, big data and deep learning. What's the relationship? Well, we now know that in many cases, because of, because of the internet, because of cloud, we can put together massive databases, huge databases, very, very, very easily. And because of that, we can then drive the kinds of databases that we need in order to train new networks. And so we can get better networks and better network technology and better mathematics. The better mathematics fuels us to go and build these big databases. And so you get this symbiotic relationship between building large databases and building ever smarter um, systems. Um, so here's typical of the kinds of things. And if you want to see the current state of the art in deep learning in image analysis, I, I would suggest you go to uh, Andrew Zissman's uh, website in Oxford. He's got some brilliant demonstrations. Here I just simply show one where we have, for example, recognized a car, we can recognize dogs, horses, people, and so forth. And this is taken from training from a millions, millions of examples that were images culled from the web. So that's that's the kind of stuff that's in image analysis. And we can go beyond that. So you can look at, for example, a movie. You can recognize who the actors and actresses are in the movie. You can recognize their gestures. So that she is smiling at him. She is approaching him because she wants to take something off him. So you can begin to now learn even things like intention, which is, is quite remarkable. And so go and look at the website of the, uh, the, the, the visual geometry group in Oxford, and you'll see what, what a discipline can do. So that's standard image analysis. Let me give you now two cautionary words about this. So this is an example I really did. I mean, I, this is not a joke. This is an example I really did. I took in a bunch of images, and I tried to train a network to learn automobiles, to learn the concept of an automobile. Okay? After all, everybody's doing it. should be quite straightforward. So I took a bunch of these, and I trained it up from these examples, and then I tried to find some examples that passed through as being automobiles, and there they are, right? What have I done? I've learned the concept black, right? Because it turned out that every single one of those cars that I had in the training set happened to be black. I had not marginalized out all the, all the representations, the variations that you see in real life so, for example, the different makes, the different colors, the different lighting, the different poses, and so forth. There's a very, very important message there that if you want to train something that's really going to work 24-7, 99.9% of the time, you have to train it on data which is representative of what you actually see in real life. So here's an example that was taken really from PLOS One just recently. And this is some work uh, by Dr. Ehrman from um, Mount Sinai hospital and what he did was he was looking at detecting pneumonia on x-rays it's not a particularly difficult task and what he did was he trained it first of all on, a, on an NIH database and then he tested it on that NIH database and he got reasonable results namely only missed one in four uh, should do better than that but nevertheless or he did it on the Mount Sinai only database and tested it and he got 0.8 okay however if you trained it on one data set and now you tested it on a completely different data set, the results plummet. Why do they plummet? It's because they were using it on different equipment. They were using from different texts. They were doing it from a whole environment in which those images were created are very, very different. And so the performance dropped. And what that tells you is that most of the learning systems, most of the machine learning systems are extremely good at interpolating within the examples that they've seen and are very, very poor at generalizing beyond that. And that, that is a truism that we've only known for the past 50 years. Here's another example along the same lines. Um, this has been published recently by uh, Octolum. If you take people who are asymptomatic uh, and you're trying to find incidental findings uh, for lung nodules in this particular case, which may or may not be malignant or benign, then it turns out for asymptomatics, and you then try to generalize towards symptomatics, the results were very, very poor. Why? If you drill down in it, 
when you look at the asymptomatics, there's a bias towards small nodules, low dose CT, no contrast agent, and thick slice. On the other hand, if you look at symptomatics, they tend to be very different. It tends to be contrast enhanced, thin slice CT, with about a three times as much data. So very, very different the data that you would train on and the, and the data that, that uh, are tested on, unless you are alive to that possibility. So that's just a cautionary word about applying what is an incredibly powerful tool and misapplying it in practice. And this is very, very easily done. So, if we now go into uh, AI and medical imaging, of course, uh, the show is full of it. And what you'll find is that there are certain things which have been very, 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 very natural early applications of this technology. So, for example, we know that in doing MRI, uh, MRI images tend to be collected by populating the whole of case space in, in frequency and phase. And if you've got the whole of case space, you can then do a Fourier transform to get the image that we know and love. The problem is it takes a while to estimate, to get to gather all the phase and frequency. And if you're dealing with something where people move, then of course you're subject to a motion artifact and because they tend to be local, that impacts on the whole of the image because of the way the Fourier transform works. So what about the idea of randomly selecting a representative set of points in K-space and then using machine learning to, as it were, fill out the rest of case space. And that's the idea of comp compressed sensing. Every single manufacturer of MRI equipment now is using compressed sensing to do fast imaging. You can do the same thing with, um, you can do the same thing with, for example, segmentation. In this particular case, for the pectoral muscle, this is done by Alejandro Rodriguez Ruiz, and it's just been published, and that again use UNET, which I referred to you a little earlier. You can do the same thing for deformable image registration, for image content retrieval, content retrieval, find one like it. I'll show you an example, find me another example like it. Or indeed, learning disease etiology, uh, for example, whether something's autoimmune hepatitis or it's primary sclerosis and cholangitis. And here we're looking at change, pro change progression that brings both disease etiology, response to therapy by deformer, deformable image registration. And this is some stuff that, um, We've done uh, over at Perspectum Diagnostics um, with uh, measuring, measuring quantitatively the effect of a drug over a 12-week period. So those are the kind of things that are going on now in uh, medical imaging. So what's going on in mammography? Well, the most obvious thing was CAD. And first-generation CAD, what you tended to do was to get an it, you would get an image, uh, you would cover it with. Uh, Christmas tree lights and various things. Radiologists hated it because they couldn't see a damn image because they've got these little markers all over it. So they hated it. The more recent, uh, we have uh, interactive card. I'm not allowed to say that this is a, a, I'm not allowed to name the product because otherwise Bill and Mar will uh, kill me. But if you turn around and talk to Alejandro's at the back there, or you wanted to walk over to the screen, oh God, I said screen point. I did it again. I'm so, I'm really sorry. I shouldn't have but if you wanted to walk over to the screen point booth, you can see this whole idea of interactive CAD. And what they're doing there is, the, for example, one of, the, one of the studies that's just been done uh, this year has been uh, to look at 101 radiologists over 4,300, I think it was, mammograms, and looked at the area under the curve uh, that was for the a particular CAD product, second generation CAD product, and the radiologists, and the system outperformed uh, 62 of those uh, 101 radiologists. It would be hubris of the worst order to believe that we can replace radiologists. That is stupid, quite frankly, and it's irresponsible to even state that. What is much more important is this second line down here. It turns out that if you take a whole series of radiologists go from an extremely skilled and experienced radiologist down to a resident, beginning resident, Every single one using the technology in an interactive manner improves their performance and the, the resident improves a hell of a lot more than the already excellent, uh, the already excellent skilled consultant. And I think, I think that's a kind of straw in the wind the way this technology is going. So there's a hell of a lot more to mammography than there is to CAD. So for example, one of the things that uh, we have in all areas of image analysis is is understanding image quality. Well, we can now measure 
image quality, we can begin to learn image quality. For example, and in fact, uh, two of our audience here have worked with me on a paper in which we've actually looked at degradations that were due to blare or to motion during the taking of a mammogram. So we can begin to measure automatically and learn measures of image quality. We can begin to learn things like, for example, breast positioning within a mammogram that massively impact the quality uh, of, of, of the work. We can look at, for example, disease progression. We can look at temporal change. We can look at the response to therapy. We can begin to learn what is significant and not significant. And we can begin to deal with evolving technologies, such as, for example, new paddle designs, new sensors, um, and so forth. You don't have to go back to basics. Of course, we can also begin to look at, um, and have done, at uh, population and uh, epidemiology. So, for example, we've looked at uh, women in New Zealand, we've looked at women in Canada, women in North Carolina versus women in, um, in uh, the Netherlands. And you see very, very interesting differences between those populations in terms of, for example, the amount of breast density and the amount of risk. And so what that enables you to do is to move towards the idea of combining phenotype and genotype, which is what um, Jack Cusick was talking about here on Saturday, on Sunday and Monday, with regard to penal, with personalizing risk by combining phenotype and either genotype or epigenotype. And that enables us to begin to think about doing informed stratification, for example, for ultrasound and MRI, and for guiding data. And my favorite of all, cancer happily these days, is managed by the tumor board, as they say in the States, or the multidisciplinary team, as we say in Europe, where you combine together information that comes, for example, from digital pathology, from MR, from mammography, with patient health records, and perhaps with, in the future with uh, uh, genome-wide screening, in order to provide decision support, that word again, decision support, not replacement, supporting the decision-making of a body that's already doing this. Now, there are very few advantages of being a geriatric but one of them is that I've been coming to this show now for about 20 years. And I have seen the butterfly of fashion flit from flower to flower during that time. When I first came here, it was digital radiography, and then it was PET CT, and then it was in data fusion. And soon after data fusion, we were looking at software as a service, and no longer had we started looking at software as a service, then we began to look at cloud-based services. No sooner did we finish moving away from cloud-based services, we were looking at AI. The fascination and the fashion of AI will pass from the show. It will be replaced by some other bright flower within the next three, four years. It is certain, because that's the nature of the beast. So what will we be left with? Well, remember my first slides. What we'll be left with is a very powerful set of techniques for dealing with large amounts of data, with new methods that are effectively developments of statistical methods and numerical methods that enable us to find features, enable us to impose order on huge data sets. We'll, we'll combine that together with our existing technologies in image analysis, in physics, and mathematics, and we'll be left with that with an enriched toolbox when RSNA is fascinated by some of the technology. I want to finish with one word. This company, Volpara, uh, which I first uh, started with Ralph Heinem working in, would you believe, uh, 1991, we started working together. We were working on breast density. And I think I just cannot move away from having a talk today that I mention the absolute inspirational Nancy Capello, who uh, all of us miss. She used to come and see us on this booth every year for years, uh, Nancy was truly, truly a heroine who managed to get breast density onto the statute books of over 35 states in this country and changed the whole idea of personalized risk and the whole idea uh, of, um, uh, of density as, a, as something that a woman ought to be told and which scandalously still in Europe they are almost never told. So, Rest in peace, Nancy, and thank you very much indeed.